Welcome to Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes, and once again, I'm delighted to be joined by Natasha Miko, Laura Bradburn, Lawrence Connolly, and Russell Boyce. Russell, first things first. Yes, talk, mate. talk us through the jacket. <laughs> I'm on the front of Alonso bus now, mate. <laughs> I love his passion. I love his style. He's got it going on. He just he does this all the time, man. I love it. <laughs> so I, I recognised his blazer. I thought I've got a similar number to that. So I'm going to don it in his honour. Uh, this one for fan Alonso tonight, man. And and an outstanding comeback second half. And just how refreshing it was to see a manager on the side. Showing that emotion, who genuinely cares and seems to have a connection with his whole backroom team. I'm watching him right now, hugging folk left, right and centre. It's brilliant. It's great to see. It's great to see. I mean, you potentially were the only person of this group who could have gone into their wardrobe and pulled out a white jacket (laughs) or so. So (laughs) you're going to have to, um, you're going to have to tell us a story behind the jacket. I, I generally just thought it looked cool, and so I bought it. That, that, that was it. It was me. I know folk think it's like stuff I wear. It's like, oh, was that for like a set occasion? Was that a fancy dress party? I'm like, uh, uh, aye. <laughs> oh, is that electrical tape in the lapels? <laughs> is it what? Is that electrical tape? <laughs> Aye, it looks I'm like it's been fraying and man. you've just tried to <laughs> fight it <laughs> <laughs> fight the fray now one thing I would say is right. I, I went to my, my first Celtic game in 1987 I have never to this day had a player's name on the back of my jersey but if I do decide to get a player's name on the back of my jersey it's going to have to be Tea Garden. what a performance yeah. again Natasha she is the star player of the Celtic side Oh, she is. She's unreal, isn't she? And it shows what a massive loss she's been while she's been out, but also testament how good a player she is, that she can come back from such a long injury and be just that good. I mean, what a difference she made. She's just, to me, you know, the team played well, a few good performances in the second half, but for me, Tea Garden is head and shoulders above anyone else on that pitch today. Her technical ability, how good she is on the ball, how good she is off the ball, her ball control, her passing, her movement, she's got it all really. Um, absolutely brilliant performance um, and hopefully going to be a really important player for us in this run-in of games. You know, I, I've got to confess, I've only recently got on this bus. You know, I'm not one of these people who are saying I have been following the Celtic women's team avidly for the last couple of years. I'm late to the party here, but I'm glad that I have started watching the games. Uh, Russell, you've been speaking about Fran Alonso's passion, which is uh, it's infectious. And then you look at the, the star player for me, Sarah Teargarden, and there's various other things in there that quite quickly um, you start to, to get hooked on and I'm not just saying this because we are going to be covering as many games as we can but I, I'm really enjoying the fact that uh, we're tuning in uh, to the women's game my only concern is Laura and I'll throw this one over to yourself are we going to be in the same scenario where somebody like Teargarden comes in um, as a standout and there's going to be English clubs circling uh, K Park or Celtic Park to try and maybe uh, you know swoop in. What, what is the the situation in terms of transfers? Are we in the realms of big transfer fees in the in the women's games here? Um, not that I'm aware of, but I would be less. Uh, the English game is uh, is growing, but I would be less concerned about that and more concerned about the French game. The the, the French women's teams are, are really strong. Lyon have been pretty dominant in the the women's Champions League. I think Paris Saint Germain have now got a team as well, so um, it's slightly different to what you would expect uh, from from what the men's game is. But I, I certainly think there's a there's a concern that should be there uh, amongst all the Scottish teams that there are teams in uh, other parts of Europe and, and America, especially who put loads more money into the to the women's game and could could attract these players onto. You know, if obviously the Celtic players are already on full time contracts, but for for other players in the league, um, full time contracts are available elsewhere and might be more lucrative for them going forward. We sat at half time, Lawrence Conley. Uh, disappointing first half. We looked at the park. We looked at the fact that they might have been quite leggy. I think obviously the introduction to Tea Garden was a massive part of the improvement of the performance. But um, what did they do differently in the second half? Do you feel that turned that game around? Listen, uh, I think Mariah Lee getting a wee bit more of the ball, uh, perhaps being professional, will have st- uh, they will start to tire against us. But definitely, Tea Garden coming in, and you know we signed her from, we did sign her from France, 
So, you know, she, she is an experienced player. Uh, definitely missed this season. But I, I, I think it's we moved the ball a bit quicker. You know, both Jacinta and Mariah Lee saw a bit more of it. And, and really just started uh, shooting from a bit closer in rather than from distance. I think first half, most of their shots were, were from distance and seemed to be easy for the Hibs keeper to deal with. Now, I'm going to run through some of these uh, comments because it's great for people to get involved in the Axon Bulletin at the best of times, but obviously um, during the, the performances that we're watching the women's game, um, it's great that people are getting involved. And Gillian Gallagher did say 3-1 before the game. And again, at half time, well done to our women's team. Hail, hail. And Francie Dobellu, good win. What a difference with Tea Garden on. She is going to have mm-hmm. a host of fans. Um, and Gillian is appreciating the style icon. <laughs> <laughs> that is Russell Boyce um, again uh, Plexi Plocks comes in to see him on the hoops and uh, from Facebook great second half Celtic were much better Gillian goes on to tell us that Tea Garden is solid and so flexible mm. and mobile fab technical ability yeah. on the ball she's just uh, she's so confident on the ball and um, there is further information coming in about uh, who I think is a star player yeah. she's getting married to Ian Harks this yeah. summer so as long as he's in Scotland she'll go nowhere well that that's an interesting us, one as well yeah that was part of us bringing her over here is that she wanted to come to Scotland because he'd already come to Dundee United um, so at the time would we have got her otherwise perhaps not um, but she did want the move to Scotland he is obviously from America as well and um, she wanted to move to Scotland to, to come over and join him so maybe we'll have to watch out for, for him moving to another club that might give us an indication of where she goes next or perhaps her moving to another club will give us an indication of where he goes next um, yeah. we'll see but I do think they'll probably come as a bit of a double act when I seen the name Ian Harks and the fact he was American, Natasha, it took mm-hmm. me back to John Harks, uh, who had a, a fantastic career both at international level and down south. Uh, and interestingly enough, he came to Celtic on trial before he signed for Sheffield Wednesday. And the transfer fee was something in the region of £90,000 that Celtic quibbled over and Harks went down south. And he was down there, <laughs> Lawrence, for about 15 years, yep. multi caps, went in football management um, and when I seen the name Ian Hartz that's the first person that, that came to my mind but it's great that people are getting involved in uh, Skinhead Soul related. Boy They're are they related? I think it's his dad Brilliant there's there's a great yeah, connection great yeah. connection to, to John Hartz who could have played for Celtic in the early 90s yeah. Same with Brad Friedel mate another States player was on trial mm-hmm. uh, I think with Friedel Shea Gibbon Yeah and we kept yeah. um, we kept Stuart Kerr, who at that time <laughs> was highly, highly rated um, at that age. Skinhead Soul Boy, much better in the second half. Does Tiergarden have a brother? The men's <laughs> team need to watch what the women are doing. Really enjoyed that game. It was a, a really enjoyable second half performance, certainly, Natasha. It was, yeah. I think we were all a bit concerned after the first half. It just seems a bit sluggish. Um, came to their own a lot more in the second half. And the one thing I think that the men could take from the women's game... It's just that desire. You know, those girls obviously were aware that the first half performance hadn't been what it needed to be. And whatever Fran Alonso did or said at half time really spurred them on in the second half. Because look, they came absolutely flying out the traps in that second half, got those two goals pretty quickly. And from there, we never looked back. We never looked really too uncomfortable. I know Hibs had a couple of chances. But from the second half, I thought we were very in control, very comfortable. And it just shows what that bit of commitment and desire to get back into a game can do and it speaks to their character two games in a row now you know we look at the Rangers game under the cost for a lot of the game really riding our luck took her chance when it came and got the victory at the end that spoke to the character the mentality of the team and again you know today you know lucky you know to get a goal at the end of the first half to go in 1-1 really not playing our best and to come back from being a goal down to win the game 3-1 and be so confident and comfortable in the second half again speaks to the mentality and the character of that dressing room and that is something that I think the men's team could learn from and how can the women not have that drive and passion when you look at Fran Alonso on the side of the park he's animated he's passionate he's encouraging them and that really transfers onto the park for me for the girls um, and again, something the men's team could learn from. 100%. And he obviously, obviously doesn't care what anybody else thinks wearing jackets like that, either. So. <laughs> <laughs> Neither nice does Fran Alonso. <laughs> it's a nice place to be when you don't care. It's brilliant, I'm telling you. It's liberating. 
It's brilliant that Gillian is getting involved in the bulletin tonight. I do like uh, Mariah Lee too, even though her first half wasn't great. I like the way she as well as others can run and go past players. She has good skillful technical ability. I was going to say that because I thought she was poor in the first half. We put some of that down to the pitch. Uh, but what I was um, really uh, surprised at is that uh, we got her name right and the BBC Alba commentator got it wrong because they were calling her M- Maria Lee yeah. uh, throughout the first half and half of the second half. I just thought it was kind of obvious with Mariah Carey but there you are uh, but Gillian thank you very much for that who else who else uh, you're laughing because you looked right over your cor- corner of your shoulder at your Mariah Carey record collection there Laura record yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, who else impressed you tonight uh, we've gone on about uh, Sarah Teargarden who else impressed you uh, Laura uh, I think Craig is uh, really good uh, she's captain I think and, and, and is sort of the sorry uh, engine of the team um, certainly puts a lot in uh, a bit more of a physical presence than some of the other players and, and seems to be the kind of anchor for the team so she was another one that stood out for me well, okay. Jacinta Galabaricici was obviously good when she had the ball Corey uh-huh. Warrington ex-Trinity High School pupil you know can right through the academy I think she showed you know up well again after a performance against Rangers and Lisa Robertson was Showing all her experience, seeing she taking it, that uh, Hibs player out early on second half. You're like, you know, she's done it all, hasn't she? You know, Slack. Down at Durham, the Glasgow City, she's been over in the States. I think Lisa definitely kind of brings you know, a lot of experience to the team. The other player I was going to highlight, there's another couple of uh, names I'm going to get through here, but I thought that when she came on, Tegan Bowie played particularly well. She seems to have pace to burn. And um, I was looking at the fact that there's been quite a few, going back to a discussion we've just had, Laura, quite a few English clubs um, interested in taking her down. Arsenal being one of them, taking her down south, but she's up here. She's a Celtic supporter, I hope. And um, I thought she was very good. She's only 17. I thought she was very impressive. And one of the reasons why I think uh, she opened it up a wee bit for Mariah uh, Lee as well in the second half. But one thing I'm going to have to say, and this is uh, going back, Russell, to our previous game on Wednesday night. I know um, by. Sarah, I know Sarah Ewans, right, you know, when she scored tonight, she seemed to put her hands up to her ears and I wouldn't be surprised if it was in response to the criticism you gave her on Wednesday night. <laughs> um, have you got anything to say about that, Russell Boyce? Yeah, I was going to bring it up in fairness because you've got to give praise when praise is due and whilst I didn't think she had a particularly good game in what was a thankless task, which I also did say on Wednesday as well that it was when we were under the cosh for much of it I just felt it was too many one-touch uh, attempts at layoffs and things that she was doing rather than holding the ball up and giving the team time to get up the park I didn't think a first half uh, display was a million miles away from Wednesday to be honest but I thought the goal was outstanding um, I love the way that she spun off a uh, player and the, the finish was, you know, there wasn't much room of the goal to be aiming for there and she, she mm-hmm. you know, did it absolutely superbly. So, yes, credit when it's due and uh, 100%, you know, if, if that's... Obviously, I mean, I'm only going from one match that I've seen. I mean, I'm, I'm well aware that she's obviously our number one striker, I believe the top scorer in the, the team as well right now. So, it's, you know, it was one game. It didn't go particularly well. I'm here to call that, you know. Uh, and then I thought, I thought... Today, I'm full of praise for that second half display, especially, uh, and I thought the goal was taken expertly, so fair play to him. You're Listen, absolutely, you're cacking yourself, Russell, you're cacking yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen that this goal described as a like Larson-esque finish by Dan mm. on Twitter. I've seen that on Twitter, yeah. And it's hard to disagree, isn't it? Larson-esque. Um, Natasha, I'm going to throw this one over to yourself. Hypo 543, sad state of affairs. Nine in a row, quadruple treble winners. Podcast excited about women's football. And the Scottish Cup quarter finals are on. Shame, but Celtic are where they are. Now, this is what the women's game is going to be up against, I, I believe, for some time. Natasha, what would you say to Hypo 543? Okay, we are a Celtic channel. We focus on Celtic Football Club and we are interested and excited about people playing for Celtic and games that Celtic play in. That is regardless of gender. We know that Celtic aren't playing in the Scottish Cup games this weekend. We're not going to cover that. We're going to get excited about a league and a team where it's still all to play for. When the last time Celtic men's team excited any of us, I don't know. But that is talking about a team who have nothing left to play for, a league that is finished. 
So sorry if we can't get our excitement up for that. Whereas on the other hand, we have Celtic players, women, playing in a team with commitment and passion, going for a league title that is still all open, all to play for, and are convincingly winning games, playing good football along the way. I have absolutely no idea why as a Celtic fan media channel we wouldn't get excited about that. No idea. No, I, I agree with that. To be fair, it's not like we aren't covering like the men's side of things almost on a daily basis as right. well anyway. <laughs> this is a supplement to that. Do you know what I mean? I think it's yes. something that should be embraced. Uh, I don't understand. Like We'll definitely be back Monday to Friday next week doing an hour's coverage of the men's team that rightfully, you point out, aren't exciting us and aren't really giving us anything on the pitch to talk about. We've got a meaningful game there today. Five of us are on talking about it. That's a good thing for Celtic, and as I say, it should be embraced. Not you know, I mean, look at the white blazer, mate. You know, we're all <laughs> excited by this. Man. Russell is all in. <laughs> Calm down, mate. Calm down. <laughs> You are all in, and Anthony Patrick Aiken, uh, Russell Alonso, like the ring to that. Uh, and he also goes on, pure class, Niebuhr. Now, I'm not sure if in your <laughs> part of the world the word Niebuhr is used, Russell, but um, it doesn't mean neighbour. All right? Just in case, because no, no. just so that you know. Just so that you know. Liam Cross uh, comes in to say via YouTube, Kiva Keenan is without doubt the best right back at the club. <laughs> Take note, JJ Kenny. Um, now, one of the points that was made there, yeah, it's uh, Scottish Cup weekend. And yes, I would love if Celtic uh, men's team were involved in that. And if they were involved in it, as Russell quite rightly says, we would have covered that game as well as tonight's game as well. But um, we got word, Laura, that Dundee United... Uh, obliterated the challenge of Aberdeen something yeah. we we couldn't do something we couldn't do in the last game um, when you start seeing that and it's a concern that I've raised a couple of times on the podcast over the last week or so uh, I do believe that they're going, there is going to be other teams who get their act in together for the new season uh, one of those teams I would guess is going to be Hibs I thought Aberdeen might have uh, been a, you know another team that could uh, be pushing uh, next season but obviously there's a big job there for Stephen Glass uh, yet to do. Uh, does that concern you when you see that other Scottish teams seem to be uh, pulling things together and we're still managerless, rudderless? Um, it, it doesn't concern me. It does make me think that perhaps, you know, it, it's been levelled at Celtic supporters this season that we are an entitled bunch and perhaps it's not us that's been the entitled bunch. You know, the... It, what's what's been proven is it, the minute that Celtic and Rangers drew each other in the Scottish Cup, every other team in the in the, the tournament uh, sort of bucked up their ideas because they knew well there's one less of them that we have to go over. You know, Celtic and Rangers being in opposite sides of the draw going into the final means that it's probably going to be them in the final. So the minute one of them's out, everybody else sorts of, sort of thinks, well, we've got a chance to go pretty far here, and then if we get Rangers in the final, then. We've got a, you know, anything can happen on on one like a one off match. So um, perhaps what it just shows is that our team, as we suspected, don't care as much and 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 are perhaps in a way used to winning in a way that the other teams are not, and so they they can they can find that motiva- motivation, and we've only provided them with more by going out of the tournament. Mm-hmm. No, you're absolutely right. And, you know, we will be talking about some other aspects of the Celtic men's team as well as the broadcast goes on. Hasboy1888, I am loving watching a women's game with my girls. It's great actually getting them into Celtic and how good they really are. We we mentioned that last week, Natasha. You know, it's something that that, uh, your girls can aspire to. It's not just about your boys. Uh, And and I know that when when I started going as a season ticket holder, uh, back in the kind of mid nineties, um, very few. You've seen very few women at the game, so mm-hmm. you know. I think it's gone full circle. And for me, when you look at the social aspect uh, of people in sport, um, it can only be a good thing that the women's game is continuing to develop and grow. A hundred percent. If we want the women's game to develop and grow, like we've talked about, which we all do, then we need to have more visibility. And the only way for visibility is for mainstream media channels to show the games and for, you know, even for channels like us to talk about it, make it more visible, because only then will you have young girls looking at it and saying, oh, I can do that. 
you don't aspire to be something you can't see. So if they can't see female professional footballers, when are they going or how are they going to aspire to be that? If they can see women playing for Celtic as a full time job, they'll sit there and think, I can do that. That can be me. That encourages and increases participation. And then the game grows. We need the funding to make sure that everyone who wants to participate has the opportunity to participate. We need the funding to make sure the visibility increases. So all these things are clogs and, you know, are cogs and, you know, a big wider operation. But first, first things first, visibility, get it out there, let it be seen and have like that comment just said, have young girls watching the game and get excited about seeing girls play for Celtic. Um, it's so important and I can only hope that going forward, channels like BBC Alba and even Celtic TV start making the games more accessible. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, um, we had a guest in here earlier on for a, a different podcast who was commentating on this game. So I don't know um, in terms of the footage where that will be, Natasha. So Celtic obviously are going to be, I think, pushing it as much as they possibly can. And Hasboy comes back in uh, Celtic State of Mind must be a lucky charm for the ladies. Well, I hope it is because we're going to continue uh, to push the game, uh, the women's game for Celtic skinhead soul boy. The men's team this is a good point the men's team wouldn't have had the fight to go in at one each then come out and blow Hibs away I'm proud of the women they have given us something to cheer after a dismal season for the men now there is an element of uh, the, the fortune in that Natasha absolutely because I think that when we look at some of the comparisons uh, you know that passion that um, mm -hmm. Russell was talking about in Fran Alonso uh, there was a wee bit of needle that's it there was a wee bit of needle between um, a couple of the players but you don't see much of that there, there is very little in the way of injury time because there's very little play acting, I've noticed. There's a lot of tiny yeah. things in the game that I think, you know, over time, the men's game have got caught up in that side of it. Um, and again, when you get to the realisation... Laura, and I'll come to you on this one. When Celtic players haven't been trying as hard as they should or they don't want to be at the club, and it's been confirmed, obviously, by Neil Lennon earlier in the season and confirmed by the players with their performances. And then all you see when you watch the women's game is a, a team of players who want to win a game for their, their club. Um, it's almost as though it's not been sullied yet, and I hope it never is. Yeah, I think... Um I think what we've seen with the, all the chat about the European Super League this week, um, one of the things that we pride ourselves uh, on uh, in the game in Scotland anyway is that even with the men's team, it doesn't seem to have been quite as commercialised and quite as diluted in terms of its intensity as maybe the English League or, or some of the other leagues. Um, but like you say, when you then compare that to, to the women's game that is, is playing with a lot less funding and a lot less... Uh, hype around it and things like that, you, you can see the purity of the game and, and the fact that, you know, that more often than not, you, we talk, we referenced Neil Lennon talking about professional pride before he left the club. You can see that, you know, that is the main reason a lot of the, the women's team are playing is professional pride. They're certainly not doing it for finances that are going to change their life in any way or anything like it. So um, they're, they're playing it for the love of the game and you can tell that. And, and just to... To back up on what Natasha said about, you know, or, or what one of the listeners said about about girls being able to watch it and things like that. You know, I'm of an age where I played football with my brothers um, until I got to the age where, you know, my brother, who's eight years older than me, overhead kicked a ball into my face. And I thought, this is not for me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, like it got to a dead end where you... you you know, you saw the odd girl uh, on a on a boys team up until about age twelve or thirteen, and then obviously for for physical reasons, like they they couldn't keep up with the the boys as they got bigger and stronger and things like that. So the fact that there's obviously an infrastructure getting put in place where girls can play football from a young age right up through the ranks, the same as the boys, and hopefully aspire to professionalism is 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 something to look forward to. And that's that's without going into you know. I, I, I can see some people's criticism of the women's game in terms of the standard of it and things like that. It's not as high as the men's game. Nobody's expecting it to be at this early stage in the development. But, you know, the, for, for girls that want to play football, there's got surely got to be an option there for them to, to progress with that. And this gives them that opportunity. Yeah, definitely. Now, 
Hypo came up with a slightly controversial comment earlier, but he has followed it up with a, a couple of other comments to say women's game is good. I watch women's football. If you're a football fan, then all levels are good to watch, and I would agree with that. And he goes on to say, he or she goes on to say, it's just that Glasgow have been winning uh, league the league with ease, but a challenge from Celtic and Rangers have made it better. It certainly does add um, a bit of interest because when you look at uh, Scottish football as a whole, Lawrence, it's always been, you know, Celtic. There was a Celtic and Rangers, there was a small period in the 80s. You'd, before then, you would need to go right back to, you know, the 1950s, and you're talking about great hearts and Kilmarnock and Hibs sites. Um, so the, the duopoly has always been there for Scottish football. And I think what makes this interesting is we've got a third club in there as well. Yeah, I mean, I think City may turn out to be the Queen's Park over there, you know, Queen's Park with a big club when, when Celtic were first founded. and for a while, you know, it was Celtic Queen's Park and then Rangers got a bit better and it was you know, set, eventually developed into Celtic Rangers. And then, as you said, the 50s, it was a bit more spread about. The 80s, you had the birth of the new firm, you know, Jim McLean's Dundee United, Arts Ferguson's Aberdeen, which died away. Then it was Celtic Rangers. Rangers died. So I suppose the new firm then becomes the old firm. Now we've got the Rangers and it's the Glasgow Derby. So, yeah. I can see perhaps <laughs> Warren. He doesn't miss a chance. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, honestly, I, I was going so well. I was going so well. Uh, Gillian, I've got to say thank you so much for your support uh, during the, the bulletins uh, this evening. Uh, it's great to have you on board. You're watching it on YouTube. We all said, Natasha, uh, now bring on Line of Duty to top off a good sunny Sunday. Um, yeah, just a big shout out to Vicky McClure, who's obviously the fiancé of Johnny Owens, um, who has informed us at a Celtic State of Mind that she is a mad Celtic fan now and I think a lot of that's down to Jory and also Martin Comston so it's great that they're spreading the word a couple of wee um, issues or topics to cover as well um, Ryan Christie's contract Natasha, um, he will be free to speak to other clubs this summer what do you make of that? Look, Ryan Christie has divided opinion all season um, a lot of people will be happy to see the back of him, a lot of people think that he could you know, come back to be a key player under new management Regardless of what position we're taking on that, the fact that his deal has been allowed to run down is the serious concern for me. That's just terrible business. Ryan Christie is an asset that could go for a reasonable sum of money. But not if we're letting his contract run down and expire. That's going to, you know, really limit what we can bring in for him, if anything. Mm -hmm. So regardless if you like Ryan Christie, don't like Ryan Christie, want to keep him, don't want to keep him... The fact that we've let this contract run down is just ridiculous and symptomatic of the bad business Celtic seem to be doing in the transfer market at the moment. Yeah, There's been... Peter Lowell should have had a spreadsheet saying like, his contract's up there, so the danger period is two years in from that. We need yeah. to look at it. Can we resign or moving them on? How yeah. it gets this late in the day? What's, you know, what's with the December thing as well, Lawrence? What's yeah. what the contract ending in December for? Why? Because the thing is as well, Surely it sticks out more like a sore thumb in his case than any because his contract is such a unique end date from what everyone yeah. else in the squad will be. So even yeah. if you've got that spreadsheet, his should have been so much more noticeable than any, anyone else's. And why they've done that in the first place, I don't understand. Um, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't mind when he leaves anyway. I think that, that, that ship yeah. sailed. But I, I certainly think, you know, December end dates of contracts really sums up the sort of sh crazy sort of way we've been dealing with both our recruitment and our retaining of players in the past sort of 18 to 24 months. It's, it's just utterly bizarre. It's complacency mm -hmm. again, isn't it, Russell? When you, you say you wonder about the spreadsheets, maybe in the same drawer as all those CVs when uh, Neil <laughs> Lennon was given a job first time around. But here's something quite interesting. And I'm trying to, in my, my, my head, because I've lost a year somewhere along the line, think of when this was. Let's say it was about 18 months to maybe two years ago. And I was doing one of these uh, Q&As, and it was actually up in Inverness. So it would have been, I think, John Hartson. And I was doing a QA with John Hartson up there. And someone very prominent uh, from Inverness uh, was at the um, event and he had his club blazer on, et cetera, et cetera, join up the dots. And he was asking me, it must have been around about Christmas time, actually. He was asking if he felt that Celtic might um, offload Ryan Christie in the January because Inverness had a 15% sell on. 
clause in the contract. Um, and I says, you know, I don't think they'll be in any hurry because he was in good form back then. And then the conversation, and, and bear in mind, this is someone who um, is in a Scottish football boardroom. It's not just a fan who's throwing figures around. He asked, how much do you think uh, Celtic would get for Ryan Christie at that time? And, you know, I wasn't going to give these incredible figures that you see sometimes in, in newspapers etc I says well maybe between 8 and 12 and he was thinking well I was hoping for more 15 because he was trying to do his own sums for Inverness Cali um, fast forward Laura we're going to lose the player for nothing I mean how frustrating is that yeah I mean I think um, I think you know, at any point, even at his best playing, um, going for fifteen million would have been a stretch anyway. But but like you say, it's just bad business that um, that you let it run down, especially if you're not getting the best out of him while he's still here. You know, there was an argument with the way that Henrik Larson left the club, and I know this is going back, but you know, people didn't really mind the way that that worked out because from minute one until the minute he. He left the club. He was one of our best players, if not, our, well, by far our best player. So you didn't really mind that, OK, we're not getting as much for him financially, but we, we're using him to the full extent of his contract until he leaves. Ryan Christie hasn't really been worth his salt this season. So you, you, you like to think if we had sold him at the start of this season with 18 months, uh, with uh, like a year left in his contract or whatever, then... It would have been worth it, not only from the point of view of getting financial reward for it, but also not having a player in the team who's not pulling his weight. I'm not having three hundred tens in the park. Yeah, yeah, which yeah. has yeah. been a big issue now. Tonight has been very enjoyable. Uh, Russell has added a bit of spice to that. Thank you very much, Russell. You've got a, a new uh, bus to be driving, I think. Uh, Lawrence, <laughs> very, very <laughs> impressed with. Spices added. Old Spice, yeah, very impressed with Lawrence's pronunciation of uh, Jacinta's surname. And just for all the comments from Natasha and Laura, absolutely superb. It's been a, a very enjoyable uh, few broadcasts this evening. So thank you everybody for getting involved on Twitter, Facebook and on YouTube. If you haven't subscribed already, please do that because we're building the channel. And as Russell said earlier on, we're on every day. We're on every single day. So get involved. Um, but all that's left for me to say is thank you all for joining me on a Celtic. Stay mind. 